Greetings and welcome to this lecture on phylogenetics. In today's lecture, we will be discussing the role of phylogenetics in the classification of organisms based on their nucleotide sequences. These nucleotide sequences can either be in the form of protein coding regions or non coding sequences in the genome. I will also introduce you to the usage of the software Mega X. Mega X or Mega 10 is a phylogenetic analysis software which you can download from the internet and use for analysis of sequence data. Objectives of today's lecture are to introduce you to the basic concepts involved in phylogenetic analysis, to learn the usage of the phylogenetic analysis package Mega 10, and to discuss the manner in which you can apply phylogenetic analysis in your research approach, thesis and publications. So why do we use phylogenetics? As human beings, we tend to classify information using different schemes because when we classify information, we can understand systems better. This also applies to living systems. For instance, a plant containing a certain set of genes may be similar to another plant which has a similar set of genes. However, it may be different from another organism, for instance, a human being, which has a different set of genes. This is why researchers tend to classify organisms based on their genes and phylogenetics assists us in this classification. We can also identify what are known as heuristic patterns or patterns which are hidden within genes and this forms the basis for discovery of new genes or new paradigms. And we also have a logical understanding of the processes which are occurring within an organism with respect to their arrangement of their genes. So where will phylogenetics be of use to you? It will enable you to classify your sequence data within a global perspective, which means if you have isolated a sequence from a plant locally, you can match it with sequences across databases. You can conduct a comparative analysis and determine the placement of your sequence within a global perspective. It will help you to find unique regions within your sequence data. For example, if you have isolated a gene from a plant in Borneo and you wish to compare it with a plant from South America of the similar genus and species, you can align both the sequences and identify regions which are unique within that particular genus and species. And you can also identify genes which have not been widely characterized. This leads to the point about the discovery of unique genes. And there are many other possibilities. Now, when we look back at traditional phenotypic classification schemes or schemes based on the identification based on phenotypic traits and taxonomic classifiers, we have limitations. Firstly, the level of resolution is very low because we are using only a few set of phenotypical traits. It's not applicable to molecular data, which is based on A, T, C, and G, or nucleotide sequences. And it's difficult to resolve taxonomic ambiguities at higher levels. Okay, now coming down to the traditional schemes of classification, you cannot look very closely at a species in terms of its morphology. For example, a, one species of butterfly may have a similar pattern as compared to other species of butterflies. And you may tend to classify these together as one species, even though there are minute differences between the two individuals of that species. The other factor which may be of concern is the age. So as a species grows from, from the larval stage or the pupal stage into maturity, there'll be changes in the morphology. And these can confound or confuse 
taxonomists who rely on the phenotypical traits. So DNA technology has prompted a quantum shift in the resolving power of phylogenetics. This means the presence or the availability of a large amount of DNA based data allows us to classify to a very fine level. The taxonomic units, for example, what are known as the physical taxonomic classification is based on less than 100 classifiers. Whereas in the case of amino acids, we have millions of uh, combinations of amino acids which can be used to classify a particular species or resolve the phylogeny of a particular species. This also leads to the concept of cryptic speciation, in which case species which look physically similar, similar may have molecular differences at the nucleotide or the gene level. And we currently have billions of bases of nucleotide data at the gene bank. So this brings us down to the philosophical question of does more information solve the problem or does it lead to more confusion? And this is one of the factors which will be constantly evolving and it needs to be addressed as the data evolves. So this is an example of the resolution, level of resolution. For example, if we classify using the taxonomic system, your resolution is actually very low. The other one is using allozymes and molecular markers for protein and these also is very low. However, when you have nucleic acids, you are only limited by the size of your database. So this definitely leads to a higher degree of resolution. Okay, so we have two kinds of trees when we do phylogenetic analysis. You have species trees which establish the hierarchy of a species within a globally accepted framework and then we also have the ITS for example internal transcribed spaces which are used for classification in bacteria we use the 16S we have the internal transcribed spaces based on the ribosomal DNA and in plants which is the focus of this lecture we are focusing on the chloroplast and mitochondrial genomes and we also have other genes such as the RBCL, cytochrome and the Ig genes. Now before we go into this tree, I will explain to you the basis for the classification of plants. Okay, now in the plant cell, okay, you will see that you have three basic genomes. The first genome is the nuclear genome. Then you have the mitochondrial genome, okay, which is located in the mitochondrion. And then you have the chloroplast genome, which is located in the chloroplast DNA. Now, each of these genomes contains DNA. So in the nuclear region, we have the ITS or the internal transcribed spaces. In the mitochondrial genomes, we have cytochrome encoding genes. And in the chloroplasts, we have the RBCL genes. Okay, so these are used as markers of choice in the case of plants. So we have RBCL and other genes. We also have other internal transcribed spaces which are present in the chloroplast. Now, as a molecular taxonomist, what you need to look at is the representation of the ITS itself. For example, is the ITS for a sunflower from Africa similar to the ITS of a sunflower which you have cultivated in Asia? So if this, if this uh, genome is similar or this genetic region is similar, you can use it for the construction of a species tree. However, if there's variation within a species, you will have to look more deeply at other regions. In that case, you can look at the RBCL or other regions of the chloroplast genome as well as the mitochondrial region. Generally in plants, it's, we prefer to use the ITS or the internal transcribed spacer or the regions linked to the chloroplast because of their rates of evolution. So that basically explains how we classify or select genes from plant cells. 
Okay, now this is a classic example of a phylogenetic tree over here. So as you can see, we have the species classified. So the species which are closely related will appear on one branch. And in most trees, you need to root the tree. Rooting is based on the selection of what is known as an out group. This is an out group. For example, Artemia salina is not belonging to any of these species. Okay, so you select an out group from a different family. And when you have an out group, this out group should basically be on another branch. And this indicates that your tree is rooted, okay, the accuracy of your tree. So always remember to use what is known as an out group. This is called the out group, out group. So that's out group species and these are the ones which are classified based on their relatedness to each other okay, so you have the classification based on the relatedness okay so another way to classify species is based on gene trees in which case we select a gene and we then look at the evolutionary aspect of this particular gene within a species or between species okay now there is something known as a molecular clock or the rate of evolution which differs between and within species and this evolutionary clock allows you to estimate the rate of evolution of a particular gene within a family and gene trees can be transform into species trees if they confirm to evolutionary criteria. Okay, for example, if a gene is conserved within a particular species and it's robust enough to separate that species from other species, then you can you convert that gene tree into a species tree. If there is too much variation of a gene within a species and it overlaps with other species, you cannot use that for classification as a gene tree conversion into a species tree. Okay, let us look at genes trees versus species trees. So how do we select it? As I've explained to you, basically if a gene is conserved within a species, you can use it to construct a species tree. Okay, so the choice of the tree basically depends on your organism. So is the organism within a genus or is it within a species? Is the gene distributed across the taxa? For example, a gene encoding an enzyme may not be present in plants. It may be present in fish. It may not be present in, uh, for example, human beings. So this is the criteria which you need to set is your gene distributed across all taxa. So you can use the same PCR primers and amplify it across the taxa. Okay, molecular taxonomy is based on genes. Okay, in prokaryotes, you use the 16S rDNA. In the high organism, you use the ITS, as I mentioned in plants, ribosomal DNA. You can also use the chloroplast DNA and the mitochondrial DNA as loci for the classification of organisms and we also need to look at whether we need an evolutionary tree an evolutionary tree basically relies on a molecular clock which means that the species which are least evolved will appear at the beginning of this tree and the ones which are more highly evolved will appear at the ends or the peripheral branches of this tree so you'll have a most evolved species and then you'll have the least evolved here, what is known as the ancestor species. So that's an evolutionary tree. And another aspect is, does your molecular tree corroborate your taxonomic tree? This is basically used in evolutionary studies in which we want to infer evolution within a species. So in that case, we look at the molecular tree which is based on a gene and compare it with the taxonomy tree which is based on the taxonomic or the nomenclature of classification based on taxonomy and most studies are based on comparison of these kind of trees 
Okay, now this is a very common gene which is used for construction of trees. It's called an alcohol dehydrogenase gene which from Drosophila, which is the fruit fly. So as you can see, this gene amplifies across all variants of the Drosophila. So this can be used to classify Drosophila. And based on this tree and the branches, an evolutionary biologist can say very clearly that this gene is evolving based on the species. So it's evolving and it's basically getting fixated within a species. So there may be multiple reasons for this. One of the possible reasons may be that this gene is getting fixed in the population based on the local or the localized environmental parameters or stresses. So genes evolve based on the local environmental st stress and they are selected against based on environment. So this is a strong indication that this gene is being selected based on the environment across these species. Okay, another important parameter is the molecular clock. So just as a clock displays time as a cumulative function, uh, the molecular clock is basically depicts evolution as a function of nucleotide and amino acid change versus time. Now molecular clocks have to be calibrated just as normal clocks based on the observation of the evolution patterns. So this is an example I have indicated. For example, you have a species which is 10,000 years old and then you have another species which you estimate to be 5,000 years old and then you have 2,000, 1,000 and the present day species. Now we are assuming that this species which is present day has evolved from this species which is from 10,000 years ago. Okay. Now assuming that this hypothesis is correct, you will basically have different evolutionary cues or clues. For example, this one has only one point or nucleotide substitution. This one has two and this one has three. Okay, and finally you have the four nucleotide changes or substitutions. And then you say, yes, we have constructed this tree based on this pattern of evolution. So you have changes in the gene. However, you must always take into account the taxonomic tree when you do these kinds of comparisons based on the evolution of the nucleotide sequences. So there are two basic methods when you construct phylogenetic trees and you have to decide upon this. Are you using distance based methods which are all inclusive or are you using maximum parsimony based methods which are assumptive in which case you assume a certain pattern confirms to a certain structure of the tree. So you have a neighbor joining tree. So neighbor joining tree is constructed purely on the basis of pairwise genetic distance. There is no bias, so there is no prior information. You basically download the sequences and you compare them. So no prior assumptions regarding the topology and branch lengths. Okay. So this is a neighbor joining tree which compares different evolutionary human genomes. So you have the pygmy and the Nigerian genome and then you have the Japanese and Korean genome. So now this comparison is done purely on the basis of genetic distance. But you can still see a very strong geographical correlation. For example, all the African genomes are confined to this particular branch. And then you have the European genomes which are confined to this particular branch. You have the Finnish, the Italian, the German and English. And then you have the American, the North and South American genomes which are confined to this particular branch. Then you have the Australian and the Papua New Guinean, which also come, is a geographically related area. And then you have the Japanese, South Korean uh, and the Southern Chinese genomes. So this is a very clear example of how the genes are distributed across continents. However, this may not be the case in many species. For instance, if you use some other gene, another, another locus, you may have a crossover. For example, a North American 
genome appear in African branch and so on and so forth. There may be some admixture. So in that case, that particular gene cannot be used for classification. Okay, the other tree is the UPGMA. So the original tree was used for phenogram construction. You can refer to this reference for this. I have cited this for your reference. And it's used for dendrogram construction. And this UPGMA can be used when there's a correlation between the distance measure used and the evolutionary time scale. So this is related more to the evolution of a gene based on a time scale. Okay, so when you do a UPGMA tree, you it you have an assumption in there, and this assumption is the molecular clock. Okay, so this tree has assumed that the molecular clock evolves at a constant rate or is having a constant periodicity in it. And again, when you do construct a UP geometry, you can see the distribution. I will briefly go through this. So you can see again the Asian clad here, and then you can see the Japanese, Korean, and South Chinese here, Southern Chinese. Then you have this distribution here of the North and South Americans. Then you have the European, the Oceanic clad, which is Australia and Papua New Guinea and then the African cluster here. So you can see a clear distribution between these species, assuming a constant rate molecular clock. This implies that the gene is ideal for differentiating between these different subspecies. Now, one of the things which needs to be done after constructing a phylogenetic tree is bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is a resampling method in which you do not physically resample to conduct new experiments. You basically do a replacement within the data matrix. And this permits the calculation of standard deviations and variances between different sets of nucleotide sequences. Okay, now when you do a bootstrap, you have, for instance, these different species. You have plant species like zea maize and oryza rice, and zea maize, which is corn. And then you have, this is the tobacco plant. You have pinus, the pine tree. You have mantkantia, which is a liverwort. And then you have these different species. You have porphyra, which are basically marine uh, uh, organisms. And then you have euglena, the earliest photosynthetic organism and these other species which are based on algae. So now you can distribute these based on a UPGMA or a NJT algorithm. Now this is an NJT, a neighbor joining tree, and it's done a relatively good job in resolving this taxonomy. Now if you look in the tree, you will see 100%, which means that this is a high level of confidence and this one is 91 in this node number is 91 so this is called a node and this is the confidence level so if you have 91 it means that you have a lower degree of confidence generally we select 95 percent and above as the level of confidence so if you have 100 percent it means that this particular branch is valid that's the way in which you use a bootstrap Okay, for the UPGMA, a similar method, you have the bootstrap. And now you can see the euglena is clearly in an outgroup because it's the earlier ancestor. And the rest have resolved according to their evolutionary status. So you have rice and oryza, which is corn at this level. You have nicotiana here. And then you have the various other species such as pine, mar marcantia, and the algae here, macroalgae, and you have euclina here. So this is an example of a UPGMA algorithm, and you can see there's a high degree of confidence. The branches are 100%. So you have 100% of the confidence level. 
कि द नेक्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ दिस ट्यूटोरियल विल फोकस ऑन द मेगा सॉफ्टवेयर सो मेगा फर्स्ट बिगेन विथ मेगा सिक्स पॉइंट जीरो बट आई हैव डिस्कस विद द लेटेस्ट वर्जन विच इज मेगा टेन पॉइंट जीरो सो इट यूज मल्टीपल अलाइनमेंट protocol so you can use cluster w you have muscle and you have three distance in this single platform you can choose your platform you can import fasta files directly with no editing required and this improves your transfer rate significantly it saves you a lot of time and you can get publication quality output and statistical corroboration because you use the bootstrapping it executes on your laptop or desktop with no requirement for a virtual computer and it has a user friendly graphic user interface it is flexible and operates across multiple platforms and it has a very high number of citations which implies it, it's reliable it's open source freeware and there is no code to memorize all you need to know is how to convert a text file into a fasta file okay so mega 10 is the latest version of mega and it can do multiple operations you can download data you can align data you can perform phylogenetic analysis you can graphically depict trees and you can perform almost all of the evolutionary tests which are cited like tajima's molecular clock and you can do the neutrality test and the ne gojobori distance so these are the different functions which you can execute with mega 10 okay so when you start with mega you basically have an in input file so we start off with the nexus uh, file or the you can also use any of the input formats which are used for software analysis okay and then you have your processing commands and finally you have your output file okay so the most commonly used file is the fasta file so you will have a dot fast extension and it this becomes your input file if you input sequences directly from the ncbi gene bank they will be in the form of the fasta file for nucleotide sequences Okay so you have different formats you have fasta you have the abi in which you can import sequence uh, files directly and distance matrix files in case you have processed this data using other software and you want to construct a phylogenetic tree using mega 10 Okay so you have the alignment command which allows you to align sequences I will discuss this in my next tutorial on the usage of mega 10 and you have to define your output in mega 4 so you can uh, you get a distance matrix file you have a phylogenetic output in the form of a phylogenetic tree and you can also conduct what are known as parsimony trees you can also select for evolutionary parameters to determine whether a gene is fixed in a particular population you can also select molecular clock Okay, so it's some of the concepts which you should be thinking about in terms of the research projects which you may undertake in plant molecular biology or in any other molecular studies are gene clusters. Okay, these are gene clusters are genes which are conserved across species. Okay, genes across geographical boundaries. This is another interesting area for research. Are genes conserved? For instance. is a gene from a cow which is uh, uh, domesticated at the sea level different from a cow which is domesticated at a higher altitude so if the gene is different at a lower altitude and the higher altitude it implies that there is selection of that gene for that altitude okay this has formed the basis for many interesting studies The other one is does genetic evolution transcend species boundaries so genetic evolution may also be involved in the selection of genes within a particular species and it can, may transcend the boundary of that species we also look at why do some genes evolve faster than others as compared to others 
and why do some genes evolve concurrently so these are very interesting processes which one can analyze through phylogenetics and they can have implications for evolutionary pathways okay other aspects are the rna families or the clustering of express sequence tags comparative geno genomics within supra genomes and evolutionary linkages between human genes so these are concepts which you can explore as you go more deep into your research okay we come to the end of this lecture so mega should be cited as this particular citation so please cite this software if you use it mega 10 and you have the authors and the publication okay now mega has evolved over time from mega 1 mega 2 until the present version which is mega 10 Okay, we will focus next on the bioinformatics session. I will go through the Mega 10 package in the next video. Okay, thank you very much for participating in this tutorial, and I wish you a pleasant learning experience. Thank you.